Thanks for joining me. The curtain will soon ring down on the year of the world's greatest environment statement. And prime ministerial hyperbole notwithstanding, 1989 has been a year which has seen the environment zoom up the political agenda. Down in Tasmania, the Greens hold the balance of power and their sway in Canberra was dramatically demonstrated recently with the controversial Coronation Hill decision. Around the country, miners and developers now know they can't always take the politicians for granted. At the very least, they're going to have to produce an independent environmental impact study. This EIS is supposed to be our guarantee that the pros and cons of a project have been properly and objectively assessed. But an audit of environmental impact studies on a number of key projects has found that they often seriously underestimate the actual level of pollution and other undesirable effects. And tonight's report from Mark Colvin raises further major doubts about the whole EIS process. The bird is a white-breasted sea eagle, an Australian native and a protected species. Despite their size and strength, sea eagles are shy creatures. They nest as far away from population centres as possible. This one lives along the shoreline at Jarvis Bay. This is a magnificent and surprising place. Magnificent because it stayed almost untouched as one of the biggest and most spectacular natural harbours in Australia. Surprising because all this exists just two hours drive from Australia's biggest city. The man is Ford Christo, a naturalist and one of Australia's top wildlife photographers. After several years' patient work, he's overcome the sea eagle's mistrust. Enough, at any rate, for his long lenses. These are the opportunities filmmakers dream of. It's an amazing place. There's just so much diversity uh, in the way of species here. There's um, over you know, there's 14 species of, of birds of prey, not including the owls. There's, there's a combination of factors. Uh, you've got an in incredibly rich marine environment. You've got albatross, gannets, uh, all manner of seabirds um, working in the, the bay area. Uh, you come back onto the shoreline, you've got um, oyster catchers and so forth. Um, there are five species of birds here which are protected under the Australian-Japan uh, Migration Treaty uh, or Agreement. Um, you come further back into the forest and you get uh, white goshawks, uh, uh, falcons overhead, uh, peregrine falcons. Um, and that's without even considering the, uh, the marsupials and the other mammals in the place.
coexisting with the environmental riches of Jarvis Bay is the Royal Australian Navy. All right, let's get them up. Let's get them up. Stop, Lord. The Navy's training school, HMAS Cresswell, was set up here in 1917. What? With their presence spanning two world wars, it's not surprising that the RAN regards the bay as home. Training continues today in commando exercises like this, and until now, the Navy has been seen with few exceptions as an environmental good neighbor. I give the undertaking uh, that uh, the changes that we believe ought to be made will not in any sense be made at the expense uh, of uh, the proper defense considerations. Four years ago, that changed. The Prime Minister, Bob Hawke, announced a big move for the Navy out of Sydney, where it's been since the arrival of the First Fleet. First, Hawke wanted to free this foreshore land occupied by a Navy armaments depot. In the longer term, beyond the turn of the century, he saw a far bigger move, the relocation of the Navy's fleet base at Woolloomooloo. The destination for both Jarvis Bay. With an area three times that of Sydney Harbour, Jarvis Bay's geography has clear attractions for the military. The vast expanse of shelter which Jarvis Bay offers to warships is an obvious drawcard for the Defence Department's top brass. To the north, they've targeted possible sites for the new ammunition wharf. Further south, options for the big fleet base itself. To relocate two key facilities from Sydney to Jarvis Bay is a massive project in any terms. Commonwealth law says big developments like this now have to be subject to an EIS, an Environmental Impact Study. The Defence Department gave the job of weighing up the move to this firm, Sinclair Knight and Partners. The Environment Department lays down the guidelines. They require a balanced scientific examination of all aspects of the relocation. That's what an EIS is for. By weighing up all the conflicting arguments, Sinclair Knight should provide the government with a solid basis for decision making. Plans for the move come in two parts. First, an armaments facility involving a wharf for reloading the Navy's ships with ammunition is planned for completion in 1991. This is especially controversial because it could involve heavy dredging and a breakwater altering currents. The longer term proposal is for a fleet base due in the first decade or two of the next century. And with three sites to choose from, almost everything about that is controversial. By their very nature, the fleet base options are going to involve taking over space on the beach. Trouble is, every beach in Jarvis Bay is special to someone. Well, this is uh, the site of fleet, fleet base option one. And these will be the... This is where the submarine pens were, uh, will be. George Brown is an elder of the Wreck Bay Aboriginal community on the bay's southern peninsula. He's alarmed at what could happen to the land where his ancestors lived for thousands of years. Well, there will be, have to be a concrete retaining wall to hold the spoil they take from the bay. Put the spoil behind the concrete walls and build their service buildings on the spoil from the seagrass beds. That means from uh, about two metres deep, that'll have to be stretched out to about 12 metres, which is roughly 40 feet. What George Brown wants out of an environmental impact assessment is a document which will fairly represent his concerns for the future of the area. Having worked for the Navy himself during the war, he's keen to point out that he's not against the RAN. 
but he does want a fair go from Sinclair Knight. If an environmental impact consultant ever said, gee, this is a terrible project, this shouldn't go ahead, look, it's gonna, the yellow-bellied sapsucker's gonna die off here and the seagrass meadows are gonna go there, and uh, he'd never get another job. So the consultant knows they have to deliver what the customer wants, and what the customer wants is basically a justification for the development. And they want it done in such a way that it's in beautiful scientific sounding language and it looks good, that it's packaged in a way that can be sent out to, as a media exercise, it can, can satisfy the politicians who aren't very smart about such things anyway. So it's a justification exercise called an EIS and it doesn't work in this country. Sinclair Knight finally submitted their draft EIS to the government earlier this year. If all had gone well, it should be available for public discussion now. It's not. In Parliament last month, the Democrat Senator Norm Sanders voiced deep suspicions about the whole process. I have a PhD in coastal geomorphology. I know that there's always a range of data. And depending on what you want to do with it, you can either prove a position or disprove a position with the same range of data. And that's basically what happens. The, no one, I don't think, can accuse Sinclair Knight or anyone of actually manufacturing data. What they're doing is selectively using the data available. There's a range and, and they select uh, a bit, any consultant will do this, to, to back their own case. And that's what's happening. As the process has run into delay, the contractor's record has come under scrutiny. The questions about Sinclair Knight started here in Tasmania with Wesley Vale. Their EIS on the new pulp and paper mill intended for a site near the existing Wesley Vale mill came under heavy fire from the Environment Minister, Senator Richardson. He said there were 85 points where Sinclair Knight's statement was either inadequate or where points had not been addressed at all. The government, uh, after the Wesley Vale decision, commi commissioned CSIRO, who are one of our most uh, reputable Organisation, scientific organisations in Australia to uh, look into the Wesley Vale situation and independently report. And I'm very pleased to say that the findings they, they came up with vindicated our, uh, our EIS findings. So Senator Richardson was wrong? I uh, just refer that question to, uh, to the CSIRO to uh, answer whether they're wrong or not. This is the report Dr Zions was referring to as vindicating the Wesley Vale EIS. We took up his suggestion to contact the CSIRO. In fact, we got in touch with Dr. Chris Fandry, the top scientist who headed the study. He categorically denied any suggestion that this report vindicates Sinclair Knight. In fact, he said, Sinclair Knight's EIS was totally inadequate as regards biological and hydrodynamic studies. Wesley Vale wasn't the first time Sinclair Knight had hit the headlines. In Sydney, their environmental impact statements on a marina and tourism project for the old finger wharves at Woolloomooloo ran into a wall of official rejection. The Sydney City Council gave Sinclair Knight the thumbs down. These perspectives drawn for the EIS were particularly noted because according to the council, they grossly underestimated the project's visual impact. In the Brisbane suburb of Kingston, the environmental issue was a housing estate built on a toxic waste dump. Families still living in and around Diamond Street. As Marion Wilkinson reported for Four Corners, it was a classic case of ordinary people needing help from the experts. All of us here are suffering from sickness and we're being damn well ignored. How long have we got to suffer the sickness? When are we going to be healthy people like everybody else? The experts on the task force set up to deal with the toxic waste crisis came from Sinclair Knight. That was in April this year. In June, a report from Griffith University's Institute of Applied Environmental Research to the local council aimed serious criticisms at Sinclair Knight's work in Kingston. The institute's review team criticized the way the firm had investigated in the field. The investigations were inadequate to establish whether the waste materials would harm people's health. The Institute found the work done just wasn't good enough to justify the conclusions. 
we present the uh, description of the project, the impacts, we're very thorough. We present it to the government authorities to make decisions on whether the project is controversial or not or is subject to criticism or debate is uh, just part of the society we live in. The fact remains that all this controversy means that the draft environmental impact study is going to come under especially harsh scrutiny. And scrutiny is already possible months before publication. This weighty tome is it. A thousand odd pages of analysis, the result of nearly three years work. The critics have already begun their attacks and they're backed by the environment department which has sent the document back for major revision and rewriting. A great deal of scientific information is being gathered on Jarvis Bay's marine environment. These scientists are from the CSIRO. They're led by Trevor Ward, who's coordinating what colleagues feel is one of the most impressive marine studies Australia has ever seen. It's a four and a half million dollar project the government's commissioned to examine the bay's underwater life. This experiment uses an expensive, high-tech, waterproof light recorder. Every 15 minutes, it notes the degree of life-giving photosynthetic light penetrating Jarvis Bay's exceptionally clear water. Periodically, the computer can be hooked up to the meter, which transfers okay. its weeks of data up to the surface for analysis. We're ready to, to go. It's painstaking work, which won't be hurried. At the end of three years, and not before, the CSIRO believe they'll be in a position to make some realistic judgments and reasonable predictions about the environment. Our leaked copy of the draft EIS, however, shows it wasn't allowed to wait three years. Sinclair Knight had a government deadline to meet. They had to base their conclusions on the first six months of CSIRO data. Information is, uh, is current at the time and uh, it, would be, uh, it would be unwise not to incorporate those six months of data into a, a report. Even when the CSIRO says it's only relevant, it's only meaningful when you look at it in the context of a period of several years. The uh, CSIRO data is a scientific uh, analysis of uh, data over seasons and periods and times and years. And aren't you and supposed to be giving a scientific analysis too? Oh, we are. The CSIRO's Trevor Ward doesn't attack Sinclair Knight specifically, but he does urge care about use of the data. Well, it's uh, just a subset of the data, and uh, you can't then talk about year-to-year -year variation if you say only use six months of information. So if you only take a bit, then you, you, you really won't know enough. You have to have the long-term effects. It depends what the question is you're asking, but certainly if you want to know what happens in the long term, then you can't make decisions just based on uh, a few months' information. Certainly you need to look at um, much more information. The function of Sinclair Knight's EIS is unquestionably to look at the long term. The new fleet base or the armament wharf, if they come, are certainly going to be in Jarvis Bay for more than a season. So why use data which the CSIRO says is basically meaningless in the form you're using it? It's in? very important to present data for the public for them to uh, to understand what the issues are. But and the CSIRO is saying be, uh, it's meaningless. How can they understand it then? I, I think uh, that you're taking them out of context. I don't believe that the data that the CSIRO is collecting is meaningless, although it doesn't have a full statistical validity. Until, they say uh, it's meaningless except in the context of the full three years. The, the use of the data, scientific data that's been 
collected as being used in a proper manner within the EIS. Much scientific interest centres on the way the draft EIS treats Jarvis Bay's extensive beds of seagrass. There's nothing particularly glamorous about seagrass, but because its root systems help bind the sea floor, this is the stuff that's responsible for keeping Jarvis Bay's beach sand dazzling white. If there's any prospect of dredging, a real possibility with the Navy move, the scientists want to make sure they know a great deal about the consequences. Local scientists and consultants are treading carefully when it comes to criticising the leaked draft EIS. The environmentalists on the Jarvis Bay Protection Committee had to retain a Californian oceanographer with international experience, Pierre Sterling, to get a frank outsider's assessment. One really has to look at the deficiencies are when the dredging occurs, they have not looked at how the sedimentation, how it really will affect, number one, the seagrass, the beach erosion, the marine life in the area. We must remember that this area is used by a large quantity of marine mammals, the dolphins, and the whales. And they strictly state that this area has not been studied whatsoever. So the EIS lacks, in, lacks efficiencies in all those areas and how it mainly is going to affect the, the sea floor and um, the seagrass in that area, which will have an incredible impact on the water quality. Um, it's going to have an impact on, on the general life and well-being of Jervis Bay. Out here on the Beecroft Peninsula, the local Aborigines believe their race was born. The rain spirit, Bandula, lived here. And the 13 tribes of the area were descended from him. We say that this is the home of Bandula because of the high rainfall, rain in our language is Bunna, and that is of the reign of Bandula. And he is the, the great rain spirit. And the forest, the literal forest, that it was all rainforest in the time of Bandula, and much more that flourished greater forests and food resources in this area, the most beautiful bay in the world. And when the rains are finished, you see Bandula's rainbow serpent in the sky, the rainbow. The coastal Aborigines of New South Wales were the first to bear the brunt of white occupation. Their descendants have not forgotten, and they guard jealously whatever knowledge remains of their ancestors. It's singular in the sense that um, it represents the presence of um, Aboriginal people. Oh, this is nice, ain't it? So, when you look at these, these hand stencils, what are you looking at? Hundreds, thousands of years of history? Yeah, possibly thousands of years old, uh, because um, sites along this part of the coast, certainly south of here, uh, Burial Lake and north of here, Bass Point, have been um, uh, tested and uh, archaeologists have um, determined the date to be around 20,000 years old. Do you think that your people have been here for that long? Well, yes, we do, because um, archaeologists <coughs> have um, surveyed sites uh, along this part of the coast, and um, these sites extend from Burial Lake, which is further down the coast, up to Bass Point north of here. Aboriginal sensitivities over the environmental impact statement are acute. Those sensitivities have been aggravated by the way the EIS treats their ancient sites. An anthropologist, Scott Kane, reported on Aboriginal sites. He's told Four Corners he was dissatisfied with the treatment of some of his work in the EIS. Kane says where he'd reported scientific facts, value judgments were added, subtly changing the significance of what he'd done. In one example, Kane's tabulations showed five middens were well preserved. Translated by the EIS, that read, only five middens. And in other instances, he says, the EIS adds paragraphs downgrading the significance of Aboriginal sites. How can we accept what's being put into the EIS? 
if there's no confidence in the way it was done and if people that were supposed to have done it say that it has been changed. So it, uh, it poses a, uh, quite a few problems for people like myself and our community. Does the Navy actually need to leave Sydney? That's a question you'd expect to find answered in an environmental impact statement this big. Sydney, after all, is the Navy's traditional home. There's been no great public clamour for the fleet base to leave. The base and its Garden Island dockyard are local landmarks. In 1976, the Defence Department carried out a study which concluded they shouldn't be moved. It would be expensive and unnecessary. They went further and spent around $40 million upgrading the existing facilities. And moving the fleet base would be costly, well over a billion dollars, even at the prices of three years ago. Does the Navy really want to go, or is it being pushed from higher up? I was between jobs, really, between the uh, head of dockyard secretariat, which looked after both dockyards, and the weapon job. So that I realised that the dockyard wouldn't move because we had big plans for its expansion. But we're still seemingly going ahead with uh, the look for uh, relocating the naval base. And I found that very strange because most of us thought that we were welcome in Sydney Harbour as a Navy and that was be our home. So the investigation came as I think a general surprise. Commodore John Jobson is a former Director of Naval Weapons and he has very little sympathy with the Greenies' arguments on the Navy move. All the same, he says, it wasn't the Navy's idea. Well, I came into this on the basis that Navy is the implementer of tasks set to it by political directive. And that the other side, the environmental movement, was being unduly unkind to what the Navy wants. It's not what the Navy wants, it's what the Navy is presenting on behalf of their political masters. What you're saying is they're the meat in the sandwich? Oh, that's a good enough expression, yes. Yes. The local MP, independent John Hatton, says his strong contacts with the Navy indicate there are still deep misgivings about the whole move. And let me tell you, many senior naval officers feel it's not on. And they're very concerned about the fact that they'll end up, if it starts, with a split administration, with no matter which government in power finding itself economically strapped and having half a naval base down here. The guidelines for the environmental impact statement say unambiguously that the issue of whether to move has to be explored and explored in detail. Uh, we, we provide a, uh, no, no, we don't provide a, a justification of the move. But wasn't the, weren't the guidelines set out in such a way as to say to you that you should provide an assessment of the justification of the move and of the alternatives? The guidelines were, were set out for us to address the alternatives and the, and the justification and but present But not to the assess case. them? No, no, it's definitely not. We, the, the guidelines, the, the contract with the Defence Department and the subsequent guidelines were asked to look at the impact of the naval proposals on Jarvis Bay. Some of the Navy's ships have already moved to Stirling in Western Australia as part of a strategic division of the Australian fleet. In the search for a new base for the ships that remain on the East Coast, other possibilities were identified. But Four Corners has established that Sinclair Knight's draft EIS relies entirely for its justification of the move on a single document, and it's not an independent study. It's the study of location options done by defence bureaucrats in Canberra to justify the Jarvis Bay move. That was a big mistake. When Sinclair Knight submitted their draft for approval earlier this year, the Environment Department homed in. Documents just released to Four Corners show the department sent the draft EIS back for major rewriting and revision. Failure to assess the need to move was a key reason. 
the letter from the Environment Assessment Branch to the Defence Department pours scorn on the study's attempts at justification. The Environment Department's view, there may be no need to move at all. The man carrying the can for the Jarvis Bay EIS is not the Defence Minister himself, but the junior minister, Mr Beasley's delegated to see it through. Unlike Sinclair Knight, the Minister for Defence Science and Personnel, David Simmons, believes there's no ambiguity about the purpose of the EIS. It's very much an independent assessment and uh, that under the, uh, the environmental uh, studies that are required in any major development like this, uh, the government must be satisfied that it is a uh, genuine attempt to make sure that any potential environmental problems are in fact discussed in detail to be provided in the draft form and subsequently of course to be made, made available within the draft plus a supplement for public comment. So we're very much uh, fair dinkum in our approach as far as the, uh, the EIS is concerned. When it comes to relocating armaments facilities, you might expect the arguments to be a little clearer. This, after all, is a modern warship taking on highly explosive ammunition in the middle of a city of more than three million people. It's bound to cause public disquiet. That's certainly the official Defence Department argument, backed up by an Auditor General's report last year which said the Navy wasn't conforming to NATO guidelines in its Sydney ammunition storage. There is another view, though, and it's a little more down to earth. This is the Navy ammunition depot at Newington, which will move to Jarvis Bay if the relocation goes ahead. You look like you're stuck with me. Opponents of relocation point out that in 90 years of operation, Newington has never had an accident. involved in the transfers to and from Navy ships in Sydney Harbour are stored and transported in a defused condition. The experts say that makes them safer and easier to handle than such commonly transported products as liquid petroleum gas. Yeah, right. There's a suggestion that it's haste to sell Newington off for the rocketing real estate value of the 260 hectares of land and not safety that's the real motivation behind the move. What's more, it seems the Defence Department itself may have doubts about the safety argument. I'm saying it doesn't conform to NATO safety standards and I also understand... Are you saying that it can't be made to conform to NATO guidelines? Well, I guess if you want to... Uh... Uh, play around with uh, those sort of standards you can and I guess uh, depends how fair income you are about accepting or rejecting those sort of safety provisions. We just happen to believe that if you accept that you should have a situation where you conform to those safety standards you have an obligation to comply. So you, well, you are saying that it can't actually be made safe regardless of the guidelines and uh, is staying in Sydney? That's my understanding. Despite the junior defence minister's insistence, the Federal Environment Department's letter of rejection raises serious questions about whether there is a genuine safety reason for moving. The letter to the Defence Department says Sinclair Knight's EIS fails to make it at all clear why NATO weapons handling rules were adopted for Australian use or how they changed the safety situation. From the very start, Sinclair Knight was obliged to explore conflicting views about the safety of Newington, not just the views of the minister. The draft EIS rejected by the Environment Department does not. It proceeds on the assumption that the move from Newington is necessary. 
To shed some light on the statutory duties of consultants, we approached John Formby, an environment policy expert with long experience in the EIS system. It's essential for an EIS to look at the question of whether the project should go ahead at all, and that's clearly required in the Commonwealth regulations that it should do so. In fact, the no-action alternative, as it's called, should be looked at in considerable detail, including the environmental effects of the no-action alternative, because otherwise people reading the EIS who have little knowledge of the project will have nothing to compare with. You must be able to compare with what would happen if you didn't go ahead, what, what would happen if you went on doing what you're doing now. And an EIS which failed to look properly at that no-action alternative would be a failed EIS? I believe it would be very deficient and it would need to be revised accordingly. Even now, five months after the Environment Department sent their draft EIS back for major revision, Sinclair Knight still believe they were right. Sinclair Knight were not asked to carry out an assessment of the, uh, the selection of Jarvis Bay. They were asked to address in the guidelines of the EIS those, that information that was available that enabled the, uh, the government to take a decision to go to Jarvis Bay. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't understand then, if, you, if you're not doing the independent assessment of the alternatives, who is? Because clearly the Defence Department can't do an independent assessment of the alternatives. The, the EIS is not about an independent assessment of the alternatives. The EIS is about proposals for the Navy to relocate to Jarvis Bay and their impact on the Jarvis Bay environment and the Sydney environment. Behind the scenes, this issue has now become a major Canberra bureaucratic battle. On one side, the Environment Department has already made it clear that it opposes the Navy's plans. Even a revised EIS is unlikely to satisfy them. On the other side, the Defence Department is fighting a desperate rearguard action to save its plans. And even if the fleet base move doesn't go ahead, Defence is determined that the armaments wharf should move out of Sydney and down to Jarvis Bay. What's at stake in Jarvis Bay is an unusually unpolluted resource. It's also a fragile one. And no one's yet certain how much development it can withstand. The fairy penguins, which live on an island in the bay, are a good litmus test. They're near the top of the food chain, so if any of the smaller creatures, like fish and the things they feed on, are contaminated or harmed, the penguins can suffer. Um, Banks here, tree here, in the woodland. We've got this um, fine young chick. He's nice down. He's about four weeks of age. Now, how uh, responsive to changes in the environment are, are these creatures? They're very... Uh, very dependent on good quality environment for sure. Um, anything that would affect their, their bait fish, for example, in the bay here, uh, even on a, on a daily or weekly basis, uh, has a direct effect on these little fellows and you see straight away a, a decline in weight. What happens if there's an oil spill, for instance? Oil spills are particularly bad on penguin colonies. Um, parent birds that are out uh, collecting uh, food for their young, for example, this time of year, uh, can, can become very badly oiled come ashore, prune themselves, and uh, uh, can be directly poisoned by the oil, or else they uh, lose their waterproofing. Very nice. But the experts say that, in fact, the EIS process is likely to be loaded from the start. I think that consultants are inevitably associating closely with the developer uh, over a long period in producing the EIS. And I think that unconsciously, they're bound to be influenced by that. And I think that unconsciously they're going to end up trying to produce uh, a report which puts the, the project into a good light. I mean, they, they, they may not set out deliberately to do that, but I think it's just human nature to incorporate some of the values of the developer when you finalise your EIS. And there's always the bottom line that every consultant 
if he's a commercial consultant, is competing with other consulting firms and will want future jobs. And so that's always going to be in the back of their mind anyway when they're producing the EIS. In the case of the Jarvis Bay EIS, the government built in that kind of potential conflict from the very beginning. Sinclair Knight is principally an engineering firm. Less than 10% of its income comes from doing environmental studies. The government's commission for this study explicitly links success with the impact study to a contract for the engineering work. Hardly an incentive to recommend the project be scrapped. Well, again, I think uh, you could uh, level those accusations at a whole range of organisations who involve right? an environmental impact statement. I think to suggest that is to, in fact, to test the credibility of uh, organisations like Sinclair Knight and Partners or indeed the whole range of other organisations who are providing consultancy services. We uh, maintain our, uh, an independent role on the project and uh, we, assess, we assess it in light of the facts and the investigations and, and the information that's gathered. How do you keep your EIS department at arm's length from your management, your planning department? We, uh, we write um, we write our EISs in a, in a proper manner. How? How do you keep those two things separate? How do you stop the vested interest from creeping in? The vested interest is, uh, is controlled by the fact that if we, uh, if we were ever to act improperly, that we would be exposed and uh, we would not be in business of writing EISs for other people. How would you be exposed? How would anybody ever know, really? It's, uh, it becomes quite obvious by reading the EIS as to what, whether the EIS uh, represents a fair and accurate picture. This is the Defence Department in Canberra. It's the government agency that commissioned Sinclair Knight to do the independent environmental impact study on Jarvis Bay. Independent in theory. Now, Four Corners has established, the Defence Department has detached one of its key employees to work in Sinclair Knight's office supervising the revision of the EIS. I don't think there's anything particularly strange about that, and I would be surprised that in any major environmental impact statement, the, uh, the proponent doesn't uh, provide as much assistance as possible. But aren't they the supposed to be at arm's statement. length? Aren't they supposed to be providing an independent assessment? They also need to have inputs from the proponent department. But as I understand it, this employee is actually supervising the rewriting of the EIS? Well, again, uh, I guess one can only judge the, the merits or the demerits of an environmental impact statement once it's available in a draft form. The environment is hot politics as we approach the 90s, and now, Four Corners has been told, the government has given the Green Movement strong signs at the highest level that it's no longer looking sympathetically at the Navy relocation. Supporters of the present laws say that if the move to Jarvis Bay is cancelled, it'll be proof that the system of checks and balances works. And environmentalists admit that the present EIS system is an enormous improvement on what went before. It ensures that when the Jarvis Bay EIS is published, there'll be opportunity for public comment. And it does mean that given a strong environment department with political backing, the issues get a hearing. But the Defence Department has already shelled out more than $3 million of taxpayers' money to Sinclair Knight. The taxpayer should expect independence and impartiality for the EIS dollar. If, at the end of the day, key issues haven't been properly examined, then that's money wasted. What's more, the government's already spent more than $5 million on planning studies for a project which now seems increasingly likely to be abandoned. And not for the first time. Jarvis Bay has been a magnet for grandiose failures. This is the site for Australia's first nuclear power station. Back in the late 60s, the Gorton government proposed to build Australia's first nuclear power plant here. About 100 miles from Sydney, it's an area in which the demand for electricity is growing rapidly, where there's ready access to seawater for cooling, 
and which has excellent rock foundations for a nuclear power station. All these points, plus the fact that this is Commonwealth territory... Placating the Greenies seems to have been easier then. The Commission says the site will be cleared with the least possible disturbance to vegetable, animal and marine life. Five million dollars were spent on this project before the whole idea collapsed. A fortune in 60s values. All that remains is a beautifully built road leading through the forest to a memory. A vast hole in the ground which local fishermen use as a car park. Some believe that all the big projects mooted for the area over the years were doomed from the outset. This is a spiritual thing you feel. And uh, you know that the place is protected. It's spiritual and at times even the sounds tell us that the spirits are still here. There's nothing to be afraid of. But the richness and the resources of this place is still enormous compared to other places. And in history, it, it has always been that way. Jarvis Bay does have something out of the ordinary, as tens of thousands of holiday makers will be finding out again this Christmas. Navy base or no, it demands to be treated in a way that's impartial right from the start. The present EIS system clearly has serious faults. At the end of a political year when Australia turned green, we should be thinking hard about how to strengthen that system. The sort of serene images that might just sustain us all until the Christmas break. Mark Colvin was the reporter. Incidentally, the EIS process seems to have developed more leaks than the Exxon Valdez. Just today, Four Corners received these documents from Australian Construction Services, which cast even more doubt on the Jarvis Bay EIS. Australian Construction Services was formerly the construction half of the old Department of Housing and Construction. As such, it gets asked to comment on big government building projects like Jarvis Bay. Well, these documents say there was a better choice all along. Twofold Bay, better known as Eden, of wood chipping fame. Now, according to Australian Construction Services, moving the Navy's armament depot there would cause few environmental problems and provide a big boost for the local economy, especially if the wood chip mill closes down. Pity the EIS didn't look into that while there was still time. I'll be back with the final Four Corners for the year next Monday night. And this Saturday night, I'll be in the Brisbane Tally Room for the ABC's telecast of what's shaping as a landmark state election. We'll be on air from 6.30 in Queensland with special network crosses throughout the evening, including an hour-long national coverage from half past nine. I'll see you then. Good night. This edition of Four Corners can be seen again tomorrow at one o'clock. Our ABC special this week tells of the events following the tragic crash of Air New Zealand Flight 901. Was anyone to blame? Stay with us now for a preview.